What's up, God's house family? Come on, are you ready for the word this morning? We sang that first song and we said, wake up sleeper. We were talking to the 1145. Come on, all you got to sleep in this morning. You came to church with some expectation for God to move, amen? See, I've learned that as I've gotten a little bit older, hopefully a little bit wiser, that life has a lot to do with expectation. And I don't mean just like having low expectations, that way nothing bad happens. Like, come on, ladies, you go on a first date, your expectations are so low that if he just pays for the dinner, then you consider it a good date. Like, I'm not talking about low expectations like that. I'm talking about having an expectation for God to show up and to actually do something in your life. And so I don't I pray that you didn't just show up to church this morning with no expectations for God to actually do something and say something and change your life forever. I hope you didn't come to church today with with just the mindset of checking the box of religious duty because it is Easter, but I hope you really came to hear a word from God. That way you can go out there and be the hands and the feet of Jesus and you could actually live the life that he's called you to live. I, I hope that you came to church this morning with the expectation of David when he showed up on the battlefield and he saw the nine foot, nine inch Goliath taunting him And he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that comes against the armies of the living God? See, he had confidence and expectation that God was going to show up, not because of who he was or his ability or his strength, but because of God's faithfulness in his past. He said, I've killed a lion and God showed up. I've killed a bear and God showed up. And surely if this giant wants to come against me, then I have an expectation for God to show up. And so church, I just want to encourage you this morning to have a little bit of expectation today that God is going to speak something to you that can truly change your life. And so just look at your neighbor and just tell him, get your expectations up. Come on, tell him, get your expectations up. And then look at your other neighbor, the one that you were really secretly hoping to talk to. Just tell him, you too, you too, you too, you too. Come on, get your expectations up because God wants to speak something to you this morning. Uh, I'm gonna preach today from this title, if you're taking notes on this Resurrection Sunday, uh, you know, studies show that if you take notes in church, then your mansion in heaven will be just a little bit bigger. And so I just encourage you to take notes this morning. Um, the title of my message on this Easter Sunday is The Realization of the Resurrection. Because there's some things, because of the resurrection, that you must realize that your life is supposed to look differently now because of the resurrection, that there was power in the resurrection. And because of that, I'm praying today that you would realize that you were not left here on this earth to do life alone, but God sent his Holy Spirit to live on the inside of you. And so I want to preach today from that title, The Realization of the Resurrection. If you have your Bibles, open them up to John chapter 20. Just going to read a couple of scriptures this morning. John chapter 20 starting in the first verse. Now, what you must realize when we pick up in this story is it is Sunday morning. Saturday was silent, meaning there was no movement on Saturday. It was the Sabbath. By law, they they couldn't do anything. They couldn't go check on the tomb. Friday, a day prior, Jesus was falsely accused, put on trial. He was beaten. He was whipped. He was scourged. He was mocked. He was made fun of. He was tied to a wooden cross, made to carry that cross up a hill called Calvary. They pinned him in place and he died right there in between two other criminals. But we know that he was an innocent man. So that Friday they took him off of the the cross, but they didn't have enough time to give him a proper burial. They would clean his body up. They would wrap him in white linen, but tradition at the time was they would, they would anoint the body with spices and with oils. That was the proper way to bury someone. They didn't have time to do all that because it was such a commotion going on. And so we pick up the story in John chapter 20. It's early Sunday morning and Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, showed up to anoint the body of Jesus with their spices and their oils. They were the original Spice Girls. They show up to the tomb of Jesus, and this is what the Bible says. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone 
had been removed from the entrance. And so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Let's pray one more time. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the gathering this morning. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for your sacrifice. God, speak to us now like only you can. In Jesus' mighty name, everyone said amen. Amen and amen. Hey, give it up for this worship team one more time. So I want you to just picture this scene this morning. They show up to the tomb of Jesus, not like you showed up to church today ready to celebrate. They didn't show up to the tomb of Jesus ready to worship and ready to sing songs. They, they showed up mourning the death of their savior, of their friend. And what's interesting about this moment is the disciples and, and Mary, they don't have the hinds, hindsight like we have. Like they didn't know that the same spirit that now lives on the inside of us was the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. They didn't know that at the time. They thought maybe Jesus' body was stolen. They, they thought maybe there was a sick prank going on by the Roman soldiers. They didn't know what we now know today. So they showed up to the tomb of Jesus to find the stone had been rolled away. And so Mary, in this moment, she's confused. She's lost. She's hurt. And what's cool about the rest of the chapter is John not only describes to us what happened the morning of the resurrection, but he also describes to us that Jesus shows up to three different groups of people that day and reveals himself to them that day. And what's so important is at the very end of the chapter, John chapter 20, John makes a statement that I want to make to you today because he says something that's so important. Essentially, John is telling the reader of this gospel, do not miss the point of the resurrection. Do not miss the point of the stories and the scriptures and the gathering and the songs and everything that we're doing today. John makes a statement and says, don't miss the point of all of this. See, because as a communicator, as a pastor, Easter is the trickiest holiday to preach because it is the only Sunday where you show up to church and you know exactly what I'm about to preach. Like if you showed up today and I said, hey, good morning, church. Today, we're starting a brand new relationship series. You'd be like, pastor, I brought a friend today. Today is not the day to do that. If I said, we're starting a brand new money series and we're going to learn biblical finance, you'd be like, bro, not today. My neighbor who I've been praying for is here and my grandma's here. and my." So Easter is tricky as a communicator because I got two different types of people that I'm preaching to today. I got the church folks who basically were born in a church. You, every time the doors are open in a church, you're here. Come on, you've never missed a Sunday. You're always here. You know all the songs, you know all the sermons, like you are churched. And then on the other hand, you got the unchurched. You got the people who just came out of respect for the invitation. You just, you know, you got the people that just come on Christmas and Easter only, praise God for all the CEOs in this place. Thank God for them. But see, as a communicator, I got to bring the word to both groups of people. And what I've realized and what I've learned over time is that both groups of people think that this day, Resurrection Sunday, is for the other group. You got all the church folks who just pray all week, God, would you bring new people into the house? God, would you, would you bring the unsaved into the house? And God, would you give the pastor the ability to communicate the word? That way it touches them and they're saved by your blood. And then you got all the new people going, man, I hope these church folks are getting out of this day what they're supposed to be getting out. I don't really get it. And so you got two different groups of people just missing the whole point of the day. And so John writes something in the end of chapter 20 and he says, don't miss the point of the day. I know we got eggs and Easter egg hunts and I know there's a bunny rabbit hopping around and I know you got a brunch to go to and I know there's church service and all these things are amazing and they're good, but just don't miss the point of what's going on. Look at what he says, John chapter 20, verse 31. He says, these are written, the scriptures, these stories, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He says, that's the point of all this, that you may believe and then have life in his name. Not life in your name, because you're kind of crazy. Not life in my name, 
because I know I'm crazy, but life in his name, your life should look differently because of the resurrection. And I hope my prayer today is that you realize that your life should change because of what Jesus did on your behalf. Don't miss the point of this day. A couple years ago, we had decided to put a home gym in our garage. Now I'm like most other cheap dads in here. I went on Facebook Marketplace and started looking for used weights. And so if you go in my garage, there is random mismatched dumbbells and random mismatched bench press weights and all these random weights because I wanted to get in a little bit better shape and I wanted something to do at home. And I don't know how you work out, but when I work out, I'm all upper body. Don't judge me. But I just do upper body. You're like, we can tell, Pastor Ben. Uh, <laughs> but Mariah, my wife, she's the complete opposite. And she's all lower body. She only does legs. I don't know what it is about you girls, but you only work out your legs. But the other day, um, she was doing a workout in the garage, and I, I went in there, and she was doing some weird lunges and some weird squats. And I was like, I don't get it. I was kind of teasing her a little bit. And she said, well, you can't even do this workout. And I was like, bet. And so I did this whole entire workout with her. And I was like, that's no big deal. I, I did it. I, I forced my way through the workout. And I was like, it's nothing. Until the next morning, um, when, I, when I got out of bed, come on, you know how it feels when you go back to the gym for the first time. You know how those next couple days are. And so I rolled out of bed, and I don't, know, I don't know if you've ever seen a baby giraffe walking for the first time, but, but my legs were wobbling, and I, I fell to the ground, and I, I, I was telling Mariah, like, I can't provide for our family anymore. Like, life is over. I have no more purpose. And then the worst part about all of it, I looked down at my legs, and, and nothing had changed. My legs didn't grow bigger. They didn't grow stronger. Matter of fact, I felt weaker because my knee hurt even more. And I looked at Mariah in the face, and I said, what was the point of that leg day. And I feel like some of you may feel like me on leg day going, that was nice and I did it and I showed up and I checked the box, but what, what was the point? And let me just encourage you today that just like leg day, you have to do it over and over and over again for you to get stronger. See, the point of Resurrection Sunday wasn't just to get you here on a Sunday so you can say, I did it. You will not get stronger that way. You will not get better that way. You will not live the life that God has called you to live by showing up at Easter only. You gotta come back day after day. You gotta get in his presence time after time. You gotta open up his word over and over again. Why? So you can be refreshed and be refilled so you can live the, God, the life that God has called you to live. Don't miss the point. The point is not this Sunday. The point is next Sunday. And the Sunday after that, and the point is not to get you into this building. The point is to get you into a relationship with your creator, the one that formed you and fashioned you in your mother's womb, the, the, the God that called you and created you. That's the point. So I'm proud of you for showing up to church on Easter Sunday. Come on, round of applause. Congratulations, you did legs one day. Now do it again. That's the point. That's what John is trying to say. The point of all this is so that you may have life in his name, that your life will now look different because you realize the power of the resurrection. That's the point. Side note this morning, I just want to say this for all the new people here. Um, you are not being judged in this house. This is not a courtroom. This church is a hospital for the sick for the broken, for the hurting, for the lost. And by the way, that's all of us. So I just wanna make sure that we're clear about that. John chapter 20, let's continue with the story. It says this, now Mary, she stood outside of the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. Let me just give you some context of what's happening here. What you must understand is that Mary and the other disciples, they had just been through a lot. It was more than just their friend died. It was their Lord. It was their savior. It was the man who they, they trusted with everything. The disciples, they gave up everything to follow Jesus. They gave up their careers. They gave up their money. They laid down their whole lives to follow Jesus's ministry for three and a half years. 
And now the one that they put their full trust in is gone, is dead. And this wouldn't have been uncommon at the time. There was many Jewish men who every once in a while would rise up amongst the ranks and begin to declare himself the son of God, the savior, the Messiah. And maybe that man was articulate and was a good communicator and could gather a crowd. And what would happen is people would begin to follow these men, lay down their lives for these men. But every single one of those movements ended the moment that man died. They got played. They got duped. They got sold a bill of goods, but it turned out to be false. And so now Mary is standing at the tomb crying, weeping, because she believes the same thing has now just happened to her. So it says this, and she looked into the tomb, verse 12, and she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. The two angels asked the woman, she, they said, woman, why are you crying? She said, they have taken my Lord away and I don't know where they have put him. Now, this is interesting. Let me teach you the Bible really quick because what you must remember is all the way back in Genesis, in the very beginning, God created man, Adam and Eve. They were given full authority and dominion. They were told to be fruitful and multiply everything in the garden, everything on earth was theirs, but God put one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, that one tree is mine. Don't touch it. Don't eat from it. And like you and like me disobeyed the word of God, they ate from the tree. And in that moment, sin entered into the world. In that moment, humanity was separated from God. And the Bible says that two cherubim or two angels came down and escorted Adam and Eve out of the garden, and into their new life of sin. Now, thousands of years later, since the Garden of Eden, in the tomb of Jesus, there was two angels. Not escorting Mary into her new life of sin, but rather escorting Mary into her new life of grace. Also, side note, there was something in the Old Testament called the Ark of the Covenant. It was a big golden chest Inside of the chest was the Ten Commandments, the law of Moses. This was a really big deal. They would carry around this ark. The ark represented the presence of God. Inside the ark was gold pots and pans filled with manna from heaven. Inside of the ark was the staff of Aaron. This was a really big deal. On the top of the ark was two angels, one at the head and one at the foot. Now, thousands of years later, in the tomb of Jesus, there's two angels one at the head and one at the foot. And so these two angels asked, Mary, woman, why are you crying? She said, they have taken my Lord away and I don't know where they have put him. Verse 14, it says, at this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. Verse 15, Jesus asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking that he was the gardener. She said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Remember all the way back in Genesis, Adam and Eve. Let me ask you a question this morning. Who was the original gardener in Eden? Adam. Adam came to have a dominion and authority and to be fruitful and to multiply and to take care of God's creation. But Adam could not fulfill the call and the purpose on his life. Adam was the original gardener. Now, all these years later, Mary sees another gardener named Jesus who came to fulfill the second Adam, to, to fulfill the purpose and the plan that Adam could not. I'm teaching better than you're responding but I'm teaching you the Bible this morning. I'm trying to get you to see that this was God's plan the whole time. That since the fall of man in the very beginning, God has been in hot pursuit of you and I. That there's no coincidence that in the very beginning, there was two angels there representing the law of Moses. And now in the tomb of Jesus, there was two angels there representing the grace of Jesus. There's no coincidence that there was a gardener in the beginning named Adam. And now there was a gardener there in the tomb 
named Jesus. This was his plan the whole time. Verse 16, Jesus said to Mary, Mary, she turned toward him and and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus, in that moment, he calls her by name. And from that moment forward, her whole life changes. And I'm telling you right now, if you've ever been in the presence of God and you feel that still small voice, if you feel that tap on your shoulder, if you feel that flutter in your chest, that is the creator of the universe calling you by name, saying to you, from this moment forward, everything changes. Mary falls down at his feet, begins to worship Jesus, and she goes from sad, angry, depressed, hopeless, confused, scared, to running with great joy because she realized the power of the resurrection. There's four things that I want to teach you this morning, four things that Mary realized that I pray you also realize as well. The first thing is this, that my God is alive. Mary in that moment realized, wait, I didn't get played. Wait, we didn't give all of our lives up for nothing. Wait, we didn't just give to the ministry of Jesus. We didn't just sacrifice our whole entire life to follow this man for nothing. My God is alive. That he really is the way, the truth, and the life. He really is the savior. He really did die on the cross for my sins. This changes everything. See, the resurrection of Jesus validates everything that Jesus said about who he was. He claimed to be the Savior. He claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed to be the Son of God. He did miracles, signs, and wonders. And if he never rose up out of the grave, then he would have just been another good man who did a lot of good things. But the fact that he got up out of the grave, defeated death, hell, and the grave validates everything about what he said. But not only does it validate everything about what he said about him, it also validates everything about what he said about you. So you got to know what God says about you because the enemy is real and he comes to still kill and destroy your life. And he prowls around like a roaring lion. See, you're full of faith right now because you're sitting in an environment full of faith. But this afternoon when you're at lunch and the waiter is taking too long to bring you your food, or tomorrow morning when you're at work and your boss is getting on your last nerve or your neighbor walks across your lawn again or your spouse just presses that one button that you know they know what button to press. Come on, when the spirit of the enemy comes to try to attack you, you gotta remind yourself of who you are. I am a child of God. And the resurrection of Jesus validates everything that God says about you but you must open up the word of God and know what he says. That way, when you are being attacked, you could remind yourself of the promise of God over your life. And so I'm gonna do an exercise really, really quickly. I know you probably don't have your Bible. If you do, God bless you, but I know you have a phone. So every single person in here, take out your phone and get ready to take a picture because I wanna equip you with the full armor of God. So this week, when you're being attacked, you can open up your phone, go to your camera, look at the picture you took in this environment full of faith, and you can remind yourself of what God says about you. First John chapter three, verse one, I am a child of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 13, God accepts me. Jeremiah 29, 11, I have a purpose. Romans 8, 37, I am more than a conqueror. Hebrews 13, 5, God is with me and he'll never leave me. Romans 8, 28, he's working in my life. Matthew 19, 26, nothing is impossible for my God. John 3, 16, God loves me. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, I'm forgiven. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, I am an overcomer. See, all these promises, all these declarations about who you are are validated by the fact that Jesus got up out of the grave. Come on, this is a, you can respond back to me. You can clap and say, that's good. Act like your favorite team just scored a touchdown or something. I don't know. I don't know what you're into, but this is the word of God. This is what God says about your life. Remind yourself of these promises when the enemy comes and tries to attack you this week. See, Mary had this realization that my God is alive. This changes everything. The second thing that Mary would realize is not only is my God alive, but my God is with me. On my best day or my worst day, some Tuesday and my birthday, every day is a good day. Why? Because my God is with me. 
When I have the, the least amount of faith, my God is still with me. This is good news. See, there's parents in here today, you know that it doesn't matter how bad your children messed up. It doesn't matter the, the mistake that they make. It doesn't matter how far away that they run. You're still for them. You're still with them. You still love them. You still have their back. How much more does God, the creator of the universe, the one who spoke you into existence, how much more does God love you? See, you must realize that your God is with you, that nothing can separate you from his love. Romans 8, 38 says it this way. Paul's preaching to the church in Rome. He says, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor debt, nor anything of all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's good news, that God is with us. Hebrews 13, 5, he says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I love you too much, son. I love you too much, daughter. Come on, this is good news. This is a realization that Mary had on the day of resurrection. But not only would she realize that my God is alive and my God is with me, she would also realize that my God has a plan for me. Jesus says this in verse 17, don't hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the father. Go, he tells her, go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and to your God. Jesus right there in that moment gave her a plan for her life that she never would have thought was possible. Isn't it funny how sometimes we can with full faith, believe the plan of God on someone else's life, but not yet fully accept the plan of God on our own life. Most of us, if we're being really honest, have very little faith that God would actually do something big in your life. Maybe we have a bad past. Maybe we've made some mistakes. Maybe we feel unqualified, whatever it is. That's what Mary would have thought that day. God's not supposed to have big plans for Mary. She's a woman. Women at that time had no say. They could witness a murder in plain sight and they still wouldn't let her testify in court. They had no authority. Well, Mary was thought to be a prostitute before she ever met Jesus. Mary, the Bible says when she met Jesus, she was filled with seven demons. Now I know you got a past, but I, I don't think you got a seven demon past. But I wanna remind you today that every saint has a past. And every sinner has a future. And Jesus says right there in that moment, Mary, I know you got a really bad past. Mary, I know you're broken. Mary, I know you're hurting. Mary, I know you've been through some things. Mary, I know you're imperfect. Mary, I know you've made some mistakes, but Mary, I need to let you know something. I feel it prophetically in my spirit right now. The same thing that he spoke to Mary in that moment is the same thing he wants to speak to you. Son, daughter, you're just my type. I know you got some things in your past. I know you got some issues. I know you've been through a hard time, but you're just my type that I want to use to go out and change the world. And so he says, go to my brothers and tell them the good news. Tell them that I'm not dead. Tell them that I'm alive. Tell them that I'm getting ready to go be back with the father. Tell them that I am the risen savior. Go and tell the good news. You mean to tell me the cornerstone of our faith, everything that we believe hinges on the testimony of a woman? See, I've never seen Jesus physically, but I've sure felt his presence spiritually. And all of that hinges on the testimony of one woman who was never supposed to be used by God. Mary would realize in that moment that God's got a plan for my life. And I hope you realize the same thing, that when you walk out of this door today, don't go back to the same routine you've been in. Realize and understand God has a plan for your life. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. It doesn't matter how messed up you've, you've been. He's got a plan for you. Jeremiah 29, 11 says it this way, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And the last thing that Mary would realize as the worship team joins me is... God's in control, that my God is in control 
and he has been in control this whole time. Wait, hold up. You mean to tell me that God's been in control this whole time? I didn't have to freak out. I didn't have to be stressed. I didn't have to go through all that anxiety and I didn't have to deal with all that depression and I didn't have to emotionally crumble. Wait, you mean to tell me that that God's been in control the whole time? Come on, how many of you can testify this morning that you've gone through a valley season, you've gone through a hard time and you've made it out on the other side and then you're able to look back over that season and go, man, God was really in control that whole time. I could see how he was moving pieces around and I I saw how he removed that person and brought in that person. I, I see what he was doing. I didn't have to freak out. He was in control the whole time. See, Mary had this realization that he's been in control. And I pray that you're having the same realization right now, no matter what situation or season or moment that you're facing, that when my job's good or my job's bad, he's still in control. When finances are good, when finances are bad, he's still in control. When we got a dumb president or a good president, he's still in control. Like you don't got to freak out. You don't got to stress. You don't got to worry. God's been in control the whole time. And Mary would realize this on the day of the resurrection. Mary would say in this moment, I don't have to focus on all the bad things that have gone wrong in my life. I can now fix my focus on the savior of the world. He's in control the whole time. Mary left that moment. And she went from mourning to dancing. Mary goes from depressed to ecstatic. Mary goes from anxious to alive. And she goes and she tells the other disciples, the king is alive. The king is alive. I've got good news. The king of heaven and the king of earth is alive. The king of glory is alive. The king of every king is alive. And church, my question for you this morning is, do you know him? He's a sovereign king. There's no means of measure that can define his limitless love for you. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's the greatest phenomenon that's ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's the loftiest idea in all of literature. He's the highest personality in all of philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. Church, I wonder this morning, do you know him? He supplies strength to the weak. He's available for the tempted and for the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and he sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives the sinners. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. He beautifies the meek. I wonder this morning, church, do you know him? He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway to peace. He's the roadway to righteousness. He's the highway to holiness. He's the gateway to glory. I wonder this morning, church, do you know him? His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy. Oh, and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you this morning, but he's indescribable. (laughs) He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. 
Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And oh, friends, I came with good news that the grave couldn't hold him. That's my king. That's my king. I came to declare like Mary, the king is alive. The king is alive. I wish some people would stand up to their feet and act like the king is alive. The king of heaven and earth is alive. That's my king. That's my risen savior. That's the God that I serve. He's been too good to me to be quiet. That's my king. I don't deserve his love. I can't earn his love, but he traded places with me. The king is alive. Can you worship him like you love him? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I realize the power of the resurrection. I realize that my life is supposed to look differently now. Thank you, Lord. That's my king. Come on, someone just declare out of your mouth, that's my king. I wish I could describe him to you better, but I don't have the vocabulary necessary to describe his goodness. He's indescribable. That's my king. Do you know him? He knows you. He knows you. He died for you. I don't know if you realize this or not, but he died for you. He died for your neighbor, he died for your enemy. He died for all of us. He exchanged places with us. The great exchange, it's, it's uneven on his part. He traded places with us sinners that why we still didn't believe, why we were mocking him and making fun, in, fun of him and, and spitting on him and why our lives were far from him, he still died for you. And friends, the Bible says that if we confess with our mouth and we have true belief in our heart that God, Father in heaven sent Jesus here and died for us, was buried in the tomb, and three days later, the Spirit of God brought him back to new life, then you and I will be saved. And that's why we're celebrating today, because we're saved not by our works, but we're saved by grace, because we have faith in him. And so I just want to offer maybe anyone in here today who's never given your life to him, who's never put your full faith and trust in him, I just wanna pray for you this, mo this morning, because again, there's two different types of people in here today. There's people who have, are Christians who love God. There's people who are Christians, but they're far from God. They've fallen into the trap of religion. You've walked away, you've stopped living for him. You still believe, but you just are not living for him. Maybe this is your moment today, this Resurrection Sunday, to rededicate your life to him, to get back in the church, to get back into your word, to, to start praying again, to start, having an expectation for God to move in your life again. Maybe this is the reason why you're here. There's another group of people that are, that are brand new to, to faith, hearing this message and going, man, God really loves me with all my faults, with all my flaws, with all my mistakes. Yeah, he really does. And you can't even earn his love. Matter of fact, you don't even deserve his love, but he still chose to die for you. He promises us a new life, an abundant life, not a perfect life, not a life with no problems, but he does promise to be with us in those problems. So if you're in here today and you've come to the end of yourself, you've realized that you're a sinner in need of a savior. I wanna pray for you. I wanna pray for both groups of people, every head bowed, every eye closed. Let me just pray a simple prayer, not a magical prayer, not a special prayer, just simply a prayer of confession. Matter of fact, I want to offer you a moment just between you and God. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you up here. Just between you and God, if you would just open up your own mouth and tell him that I'm a sinner in need of a savior, just confess that I've, I've fallen short of your glory. I haven't met the standard that you've called me to live. I've come to the end of myself and I've realized that I can't do this life without you. Maybe you're watching online at a different moment in time and maybe you're driving in your car, 
working out. Maybe right here in this moment, God is calling you to say, it's time to, to rededicate. It's time to fully surrender. So just between you and God right now, in this moment, just tell him, God, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. God, I believe that you died for me. God, I believe that you sent Jesus and he was killed on a cross on my behalf. He was buried in a tomb, but God, I believe he didn't stay there, but he got up out of that grave to give me new life. And today, right now, in this moment, I choose to put all of my faith and all of my trust in you. Holy Spirit, would you fill me right now? Would you change my life forever? Would you lead me? Would you guide me? Come on, just between you and God, out of your own mouth, your own confession. God, I need you in this moment. God, right now, I choose to make you my Lord and my Savior. God, I'll never be the same after this. God, I realize that there's power in the resurrection. God, I realize that you're alive, that you're in control, that you got a plan for me. God, I realize what you did for me on the cross. And so now God, use me to change my world. Use me as your hands and as your feet. Come on, just between you and God. I rededicate, I resubmit my life to you. And we all pray these prayers in the name that's above every other name, the matchless name, the mighty name, the only name that can heal, the only name that could forgive, the only name that could set free, the only name that has the power to give you new life. And that's the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen. Hey, would you put your hands together this morning for this word? Come on, would you thank God for the word of God?